Hey everybody, Stem Minority here. Um, tonight I'm going to be talking about the, uh, I'm going to be continuing the How to Read a Research Paper series. Uh, last time in the How to Read Research Paper series, we talked about the abstract. Um, and basically that's sort of the introduction into the paper, the um, what is the author doing, what results did the author come to, you know, and basically just informing you of the general layout of the paper and things of that nature. Um, so again, tonight, I think I said last time I'll be talking about methods. Um, so that's what I'm gonna do, that's what I'm gonna do tonight. Uh, I haven't been posting um, on schedule only because um, last week I got hit with a lot of tests. Um, I had to take like maybe seven tests for classes and then I had to take a mock MCAT test, so. Yeah, last week was pretty rough, um, so I've only gotten enough time to actually post tonight, so um, here I am. Uh, sorry about that. I think I might not, you know, stick to that schedule only because I am a student, so um, it, uh, it is going to be kind of hard to stick to a post-everyday schedule, but, you know, I'll post whenever I can, okay? So that being said, uh, let's go ahead. So, first, before I press this button, um, we are going over the methods, but there is a section before the methods that I skipped, and that's the introduction. And I will be doing the introduction into, in a later video, but I don't think it's as important, because all the introduction is really saying is, is stating the background observations from the author, and how the author came to the hypothesis that he generated um, so it's not really it's not really hard um, so I'll just probably do that in another video and it'll be a lot shorter than this one okay so regarding the methods so when you're going into the methods um, you've you're you, you've already like kind of developed um, some background information as to what you want to do and what question you want to answer so you've already done all your readings and now and then you sat and you thought, huh, you know, based off this information, I've generated this hypothesis. And now you're trying to see, OK, how can I test this hypothesis? Well, in order to test that hypothesis, you need to run experiments. So that means that you need to see, OK, what what experiments can I run to actually answer and test the hypothesis? And then there's a whole. And there's also going to be a whole separate video as to what are proper hypotheses and what, you know, um, yeah, what are proper hypotheses. Because sometimes you can make a hypothesis that's not, honestly not testable. Um, but yeah, you've developed a topic, you have a hypothesis, and, and you're trying to expand your knowledge for experimentation. So you're trying to see, okay, how many experiments are out there? that's actually relevant, you know, that's, that I can actually use to answer my question. Um, and I'll just tell you right now, there's a lot of experiments out there. And then something else you should note is that each um, scientist puts their own little spin on the experiment sometimes. So it's not always like, okay, well, this person did this, so I'm going to replicate it. No, it's because for one, that's not original. And then two, your experiment might not um, might not call for the same experiment as somebody else. So just keep that in mind that, you know, you might see two experiments and they're like, huh, they, they look kind of the same. And they're not. Like, for example, BG11, which is when I was working in Dr. Shohan's lab, we used that for, um, for al al um, algal cultures. And I, I know that there's a lot of different ways to make BG11. Uh, but that, I'm going to talk about that in the next slide, because even though there's a lot of ways to make BG11, there's a common fundamental um, when it comes to, uh, yeah, when it comes to it. So um, the questions that you that you will get um, uh, that or the questions that you might have while you're reading the experiment is what is the author looking for in that experiment? Like, the why are you doing this experiment? You know, 
for example, you might need, um, if you're trying to clone, or if you're trying to reproduce DNA from a bacteria, the thing that you might need is the genome of that bacteria, you know, because, uh, you know, with DNA, you have to be able to, one, set up your primers um, in order to even target your gene of interest. So that's the first experiment to do is to do, you know, some sort of um, genome um, sequencing. And then you go into, you know, trying to find the right protein to get, or trying to find the right primer to get the protein. So what was the author looking for in that experiment? The example I gave you is, well, if you're trying to get, trying to find protein expression, then the first experiment you would do is genome sequencing. And the reason why you do that is to find the DNA. So uh, I probably said it like 700 times now, so I'll keep moving. Um, how, how the author did the experiment in regards to procedures. So I told you that, you know, um, he would do genome sequencing, but a lot of you out there probably don't know how to do genome sequencing. So you're just like, I don't know how to do that. And I don't even know, and you wouldn't even know where to start, you know? Um, so the, the, um, author might sometimes go step by step as to what they did to do the um, experiment or like what procedures they follow to do the um, experiment. And then finally, um, how uh, the individual experiments are, let me edit that out, how the individual experiment um, affected the experiment at large. So in a paper, there are, you're probably going to find many experiments. Like there's, Sometimes there are papers that have just one experiment, but it's sort of misleading because there were a lot of experiments to lead up to that one big experiment. And they probably just wrote that paper on that one big experiment. But in reality, um, when you're doing science, you have to run a lot of experiments just to get one conclusion. You know, like if you're trying to do a um, an analysis on how bacteria, you know, degrades uranium, you have to run experiments on, okay, can the bacteria survive in the uranium? Just how well can it degrade the uranium? What environmental factors might inhibit its ability to degrade uranium? Or what environmental factors may improve its ability to degrade uranium? You know, things of that nature. So how did the, there's a lot of experiments that an author will run, but each experiment is done with a purpose and the question that you might have is, you know, why did, what, what purpose did that experiment fulfill, right? And that may, might overlap with this up here, um, but I guess the difference between these two is, okay, as you're reading through it, you're sort of trying to put yourself in the mindset of the um, scientist, like, okay, you know, I want this, so, you know, what, the, you know, you would ask yourself, okay, what what do I need to get to point A, you know? And then, you know, it'll have that those intermediate steps, whereas the last one is more, you're at the end of it. And, or you're at the end of that intermediate step and you ask yourself, okay, how did that intermediate step help me get any closer to point A? It's kind of hard to explain, but, you know, again, I'm going to go through it with y'all. So um, the ideology um, that you want to have going into uh, the methods is, okay, for those of us that are experienced, you want to ask yourself, does the experiment, you know, relate to what we're trying to do? Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of methods out there. There's a lot of different questions that the methods are answering, but only one question is actually relevant to what you're trying to do. And then it's also, there's also a scope that goes to your experiment. Like sometimes some experiments are a little too sensitive and you don't want to do that. You just want to, and then sometimes some experiments are just um, way too expensive, you know, and your particular topic might not call for, you know, a large expense and you might not even have a lot of resources to begin with. So, um, 
yeah, there's a lot of, basically, if you're experienced, you're trying to ask yourself, you know, does this fit what I'm trying to do? Um, for beginners, and even though I say beginners, honestly, this also goes for those of us that are experienced too. Um, you want to you wanna ask yourself, um, like, what questions are you, when, when you ask a question, you need to already know that, okay, there's an experiment for your, there's an experiment to get the answer. Okay, so you need to know, um, you need to know the questions that you need to get to, um, to get to point A, if that makes sense. Like if you're trying to do something, you need to ask, you need to know the questions that you're trying to ask. And that only comes with reading papers and really reading the methods, okay? Um, so second, um, what questions are your experiments trying to answer? So again, each experiment has its own individual answer and not all experiments will give you the same answer and to the same degree. So you need to know when you are asking your question, you need to know which experiments are actually relevant to your question. Um, and yeah, uh, that's what I just said. The third, top, well, the third point is exactly what I just said. Um, are the answers that the experiments gave you actually relevant to your topic? You know, um, some some experiments don't need to be done. Honestly, I mean, it's it's cool if it needs to be done, but they're not. It helps you. It helps make it helps power your paper and make your finding all the more. It's basically like okay, the experiment gave gives you more evidence to sort of help um, your paper not really prove your paper, but, you know, help your paper stand. But, you know, there's only certain fundamental experiments that you need to do in order to give your paper a good base. All the other experiments will just be extra, almost. And the last question, and I think this is the most important, is what is the fundamental basis for the procedure? And, in other words, how um, the procedure... Uh, uh, that's probably that's pretty bad. Um, how the procedure um, actually goes about answering your um, question. So, in other words, if you're trying to again do um, a genome sequencing, I f it would be a pretty good idea to know how to do genome sequencing and what's the fundamental behind it. You know, if you're trying to stain bacteria to see under a microscope it'd be a pretty good idea to know how to stain it. You know, not just not just why you're staining it, but also how to stain it in the first place. Otherwise you're just pouring chemicals on bacteria and that's not gonna get you that's not gonna get you anywhere. So um, usually in these it's it's cool to take notes um, on uh, in this part right here. Um, I mean it's cool to take notes throughout the paper, but I think um, in the methodology, it's probably the most important to take notes. And as far as when you're reading papers, um, you only you only start to go through the paper when you see that the paper is actually relevant to your um, to your topic of interest. If the paper is not relevant to your topic of interest, don't read the methodology. Just stop at the abstract and keep it rolling because it's not relevant. Okay. So you only read the methods if the paper is actually relevant, that you actually sat down, you have your papers in front of you, and now you're going to start reading the uh, methodologies. And I would more or less, when you're reading the methodology, don't read too far into depth. I think you should first scan it, you know, for a first round. Like, take a note of what experiments are foreign to you. Like, okay, they said... They did, they did some Mikowski thing, and it's like, I don't know what that is. Write it down, and then look it up later, okay? All the experiments that they run, just write them down and look them up later if you don't know them. But if you do know them, then take note of it. Um, take note and ask yourself, okay, they did this. I know how to do it, but is it relevant to what I'm trying to do, okay? Um, so that being said, uh, let's go through uh, our first paper. So um, let's go ahead and do. Uh, we can go, we can do genome, I guess. 
All right, what do we get here? Hopefully nothing too complex. <laughs> this is not where I want to be. Hold up. Pub. Med. There. It's definitely not what I want to be. Um, actually, let's do bacteria protein. Investigation on adhesion of sulfur, bacillus, thermosulfido oxidans via atomic force microscopy equipped with uh, minial probes. Uh, affinity and special specificity of motif based protein protein interactions. Is, it, is that recent? Uh, evolutionary conversion and functional implications of circular mode. You know, let's just do this one. Um, so before I begin, uh, credits to Lee Q, Becker T, Zhang R, Zhao, and Sand. Again, I'm just I'm just sort of teaching people how to do it. Not hopefully this is not plagiarizing. I don't know how YouTube operates anymore. Um, so investigation of adhesion. So adhesion, you're sticking to something of this kind of bacteria. You don't need to don't need to know what it is exactly it's just a certain kind of bacteria via atomic force microscopy so they investigated adhesion via this procedure so atomic force microscopy equipped with mineral probes so atomic force microscopy equipped with mineral probes that is the procedure that they used um and i guess they start they'll talk about it in this paper so um I'll read the abstract. This will count as an abstract reading, but I will put it as um, in the like you know again it's the it's a methodology tutorial, and again um, you need to read the abstract first. You need to start from the beginning, okay? Um, just to understand what the author is trying, what question the author is trying to answer, in order to understand how the how the procedures even relate to the question at hand. So, bacterial adhesion is a key step to prevent environmental problems called um, acid mine drainage or to improve leaching efi efficiency in industry since it initiates and enhances bio-leaching. So, um, bacterial adhesion, you're trying to basically ed prevent environmental problems. This is a pretty, I wish every beginning sentence was this simple. Um, but yeah, so off rip, we want better bacterial adhesion um, to improve places in industry and the environment. And it also enhances bioleaching. Thus, to analyze bacterial adhesion and to understand this process, and, into, and to understand this process is crucial. In this study, atomic force microscopy, so again, the um, procedure equipped with pyrite or chalk or pyrite tip was applied to study the adhesion of sulfobacillus of this kind of bacteria okay so they did this procedure it was equipped with this tip and they studied the adhesion of this bacteria the results illustrate that these kind of cells of both of these kind of strains of this kind of bacteria again use replace you know whatever you don't know with simpler words show more affinity to pyrite than to chocolate pyrite so something that you get, that we have to take note of is what's the relevance of pyrite and chocolate pyrite to i guess the industry and to bio leaching and things of that nature um all we know is that um this bacteria sticks more to pyrite than to chocolate pyrite. However, the interactions between bacteria and chocolate pyrite can be strengthened if the bacteria are brought into contact into contact with the chocolate pyrite. So um yeah, that's that's pretty much self explanatory. If you place the bacteria on chocolate pyrite, it, it'll stick better. Alright. The biofilm cells show low affinity to either pyrite or choco pyrite. Um, so, as you know, or you probably don't know this, but bacteria do 
have certain pathogenic factors and they can secrete a biofilm. Um, so I guess it doesn't stick well to either pyrite or chocopyrite. A high content of proteins in the extracellular uh, polymeric substances collected from these kind of cells. Um, so they collected proteins in extracellular, so outside of the cell. They collected proteins outside of the cell um, from these kind of bacteria. Um, and a low content of proteins collected from biofilm, uh, EPS, um, again, extracellular polymeric substances. They just didn't indicate that it meant that they abbreviated EPS, or at least I'm assuming that EPS is what I just said indicates that proteins play a role in initial adhesion. So that's the answer to your question. You know, uh, proteins play a role in the ad initial adhesion of that bacteria to pyrite or chocopyrite. Um, analysis of adhesion force distance curves reveal that adhesion by pyrite grown cells is a complex interaction involving several bonding forces. So uh, we know that um, the proteins help it bind, but it's complex how it binds. So I'm not going to read that again because this paper is not um, focused on... Uh, I hope we don't have to pay for this. I really don't. Because your boy is broke. Okay. <sighs> You've got to be kidding me. Uh, results. Oh, oh, wait. We don't have to pay for it. Cool. <laughs> Um, so, oh, here's the, so again, materials and methods. So I'm just going to read it through you. So they first ran, so here, I'll even take notes with you. Sticky notes. Uh, where is it? Come on. Stop being a bum. Thank you. Oh, uh, this is not now. Uh, sorry, y'all. <laughs> I hate when it does that. Um, I had to bring it back on, y'all. Sorry about that. But anyways, I'll, t I'll be taking notes with you. Um, okay. So, first thing they did was strains and cultivation. So, they... So, I guess, yeah, the important step in this whole process is first being able to cultivate your bacteria of interest. You can't really study strain thermosulfur oxins, you know, you can't really study the bacteria in question if you don't have it. So first things first, um, in this experiment, they needed their strain. So they cultivated it in the best condition that they thought um, so they got the bacteria from, um, I guess this company from Germany, uh, the strain was cultivated in sterilized Macintosh medium. So you don't know what, you probably don't know what Macintosh medium is. So you want to type it, right? Um, so the Macintosh medium containing... 0.02% yeast extract, 2% pyrite grains, or 1% elemental sulfur. So this is where I was talking about how each scientist puts their different spin on the um, on the um, on their experiment. They wanted to experiment with pyrite, so they put the pyrite in the medium, um, and yeah, and they put 1% sulfur in the medium because that's what they're that's what they're experimenting with they're experimenting with pyrite and chocolate pyrite so it's kind of important to have it in the medium um and the sulfur was added as an energy source and i guess i'll just tell you now that you know all bacteria all living things need certain elements to survive so um it's no surprise um, that they added sulfur. I mean, uh, I don't know how to explain that. Um, so again, they used Macintosh medium. You probably don't know what that is. And they added to it by adding these ingredients. And they at first, 
So they say that um, um, they the medium had an initial pH of 2.5, but they probably increased the pH or raised the pH um, to an optimal range to see at what range the um, the bacteria could actually grow. Because usually anything that acidic is not you know healthy for any bioorganisms or proteins for that matter. So they just understand that they probably raised this. Um, and the bacteria were cultivated at 45 degrees C on a rotary shaker at 140 RPM. So um, you need to understand um, why you would use a rotary shaker if you're like, again, brand spanking new to this. Um, you know, because basically a rotary shaker helps homogenize the um, solution containing the um, bacteria because you don't want the bacteria just to sit and then it uses the ingredients in one area of the medium, but then it can't, you know, move around to other areas. So they've, cult they've been cultivating it like this. They've kept it going. And yeah, this is pretty straightforward, you know, again first step you cultivate it and really um, I'm not gonna go through all of this with you but that's really the major way you would read something you would first understand what they were trying to do they were trying to cultivate it and then you would say okay what in here do I not understand and can I apply anything to what I'm trying to do so I'm gonna start by saying this um, mediums are very common especially when you're dealing with bacteria or even cells of any nature. So this is more than likely going to be common across all experiments, on the exception of most experiments probably might not add this. Again, this is the author's spin for his particular experiment. Um, I am going to be uh, posting videos on various methods, um, you know, methods for making mediums or how to or instructions on what a rotary shaker is and things of that nature um, so that you know when you guys are thinking about designing an experiment you already kind of know what what you want to do and how the experiment at hand helps you attain what you're trying to do so that being said i'm going to go ahead and end it tonight um if you found this helpful uh, you know, go ahead and leave a like, tell your friends, um, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much it.